Hello everyone, welcome to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. Those of us who are joining us again, pleasure to have you back. Those of us who are joining us for the first time, uh, let me just let you know that we are the UK's leading pro-marriage organisation. Uh, we've got uh, tens of thousands of supporters from all faiths and none, I might add, but uh, all joined together by this thought that one man, one woman marriage is something which is unique and needs to be preserved and uh, highlighted. Now, before you say other things exist, of course, other things exist. We recognize that. And as we go further in society, more things will turn out to be existing, I'm sure. But actually, we recognize that one man, one woman marriage is unique and it brings particular benefits. And uh, perhaps we'll discuss more of that as we go forward uh, in our interview today. I did mention we're from all faiths and none, but we do have a Christian minister with us, somebody who uh, spoke to us very recently about uh, changes in the Kirk in Scotland, uh, Reverend William Philip of the Tron Church. Uh, William, would you like to say hello to us? Hello, it's uh, very good indeed to be with you, Tony. Well, it's great to have you here also. Now, uh, I understand, William, that you trained as a cardiologist and uh, then uh, switched into being a church minister. Uh, I wonder, just before we start, could you give us a little bit about that background and why that happened? Yeah, I, uh, I, I went from school to uh, university, medical school in Aberdeen, trained in uh, medicine and then further training in general medicine and was specializing in cardiology. Um, but I had, I suppose from my early student times, uh, well, it was interesting. My father was a minister, so I start as many people who grow up in a in a church uh, a ministry household. The one thing they're determined is that they will not do that themselves, and I, I was like that. So I was very determined not to be a minister. But during my early, I suppose, undergraduate years, uh, I was very involved in the Christian Medical Fellowship in uh, Christian Union, mm -hmm. UCCF, and so on. Uh, increasingly involved in lots of ministry and uh, I thought for a long time I'd be able to do both things so my uh, you know one of the things I thought about was working abroad in medicine medical mission that kind of thing but um, gradually it just became obvious that uh, for a number of reasons that that it's very difficult to do both of those things really and um, I came to a point where I had to decide uh, was it going to be was I going to throw myself wholeheartedly into into uh, ministry uh and if i did then really i couldn't carry on my medicine as well so mm -hmm. I, I i sort of reluctantly laid aside my stethoscope and um mm. and, and got full-time into ministry mm. so you chose the one that paid more <laughs> yes well <laughs> not really <laughs> when people when people ask uh, what i miss uh certainly in the early as i say well it's usually at the end of the month when i look at my paycheck but uh no, <laughs> yeah. no i've lost nothing uh, I've lost no nothing. no right. and i'm sure you've gained an awful lot as well so that's immensely that's, that's yeah. marvelous so we um w when you you did something you said a few words for us um recently about the the kirk in scotland uh, adopting um or, or, or recognizing same-sex unions before we get on to that for those of us who are not familiar with the the ecclesi ecclesiastical situation in scotland do you just want to outline it a little bit more generally for us yes well the the church of scotland is the national uh, church in scotland so akin to the church of england uh, in england um in many respects you could say it's very similar to uh, the, the Church of England. The main difference is in terms of its governance. So rather than being Episcopal, it's uh, it's Presbyterian. Mm. Um, so in some respects, it's different. But it, I would say it's more like the Church of England uh, in terms of it being, uh, well, supposedly broad church and um, uh, and national and uh, and all of that. So it's the it's the kind of main line. D denomination I mean there's obviously lots of others the, the same as there are in, in other parts of the United Kingdom but mm. um, uh, but it's the Church of Scotland would be the main uh, main denomination but um, like the Church of England perhaps even more so sadly in in recent years it's been very much in decline mm. and um, it's it's although it's called the National Church it is a it's a it's a tiny minority of the population now who would be a, a, a associated with it well, well under I think well under a tenth of the population would even claim a, a connection, mm. I think, nowadays with mm. the Church of Scotland. So you, you joined the, the Kirk, as it's called, K-I-R-K, yep. is that right? Um, yes. So you joined the Kirk uh, and then you, you, you left it uh, further to some trouble which started about 10 years ago, is that right? Do you want to tell us a bit about that? 
Yeah, a little more than that, really. I mean, I grew up, uh, my father was a Church of Scotland minister um, and I uh, grew up in the in the Church of Scotland. Uh, we would have been uh, part of a minority of uh, evangelical uh, churches within the denomination, but uh, quite a significant minority. It was a natural place for me to be to, to go into ministry at that point uh, in, in the mid 1990s. Um, but even then, I suppose trouble was brewing. And um, I was an assistant minister in Aberdeen. I moved from there to London to work for five years uh, at the Proclamation Trust. And I came back to Scotland in 2004 to be minister of the, of the Tron Church. And um, within really quite a short period of time, we were uh, beginning to face quite um, a lot of pressure beginning you know, presenting itself in terms of um, the uh, same-sex relationships and that kind of thing. So I think as early as 2006, uh, things were brewing there. But it really, it came to a head in 2009 when uh, a minister um, in an openly declared homosexual relationship uh, was being appointed to a church in the Presbytery of Aberdeen. And um, that was what fermented uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, discussion about all of that and the opposition to that. Mm. But in the General Assembly of the church, which is, I suppose, you, like the General Synod, if you like, of the Church of England, um, in that year um, declined to uphold its historic position, uh, which is uh, safeguarding the uniqueness of um, marriage between man, man and one woman. And that was really when the, the Rubicon was finally crossed. Mm. There was a two year theological commission set up. So many of us worked very hard during that time to try and um, maintain the position on marriage. But in 2011, uh, that was not reversed. And really that was when the die was cast. So at that point, we had warned our presbytery we wouldn't be able to remain in proper uh, connection and fellowship should that happen. Mm. And so at that point, we began the process really to have to uh, to disengage. And we finally left the, the denomination in, in 2012. And at that time, there were maybe 20 to 30 uh, congregations uh, who over a period of time uh, separated themselves um, and quite a lot of others, um, ministers who um, uh, also left at, at that time. So there was a fair bit of disruption it was certainly a, very, a small minority in comparison to the overall numbers in the church but but actually uh, quite, most of those were quite significant sized churches and and uh, in, in terms of numbers and in mm. terms of you know financial mm. contribution to the church so it wasn't it wasn't all that insignificant um but yes that was over a decade ago so what actually happened at, at this year's general assembly was really a final public admission of what had actually happened 10 years before mm. 10 years before it was said well we're not really not really making a change it's just a sort of you know it's not that big and uh, and so on and so forth mm. but in fact as as a decade has passed it's become much more easy to to just come right out and say yeah we've 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 ditched what we always believed in mm. so explain to me uh and i uh I listened because um, I live in Wales. I listened to the, the discussions that went on in, in Wales quite closely, but I, I haven't done that uh, in the Kirk. But um, what the background, I mean, how I, ironically in the back of my mind, of course, is, is the fact that the, the Catholic Church uh, not too long ago issued a statement saying marriage can only be between man and woman because that's what the Bible says. Yet they don't see scripture as their sole authority. But I thought the Kirk did. And they're, you know, they, they're in fact saying, well, yeah, we know that's the sole authority. But so w from their point of view, I mean, what's their case? How, how did they come up with this? <laughs> well, um, not by taking scripture seriously. I mean, I think that's the that's the bottom line. I listened to a discussion on the radio just the other day between uh, a minister who's very pro this, in fact, who was very much at the heart of this to begin with, and and uh, and and somebody who was defending the traditional mm. position. And really, the argument was, well, we've got to look at uh, the way the world thinks now. We've got to look at uh, what modern science tells us. We've got to look at basically every other authority, and then interpret scripture in the light of of that. In other words, we decide we decide what society wants and what we want, and then we find a way of mm. of, of, of kind of mm. saying, well. There is a way of interpreting the Bible 
uh, like that, but it's 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 not coherent. It doesn't bear scrutiny, and um, there's not even very much um, there's not really very much effort now made to try and um, uh, exegete scripture to say these things because it, it's you know it, it it's it's there have been so many weighty scholarly tomes that mm. have shown that you just can't mm. you can't twist scripture in that way so mm. actually most people now give up and say well other things have got to be uh, got to take the primacy and, th and that's the bottom line I'm afraid and I do think with the Church of Scotland the the belief is we've got to move with the times otherwise the church will be left behind and ignored and and will die out I mm. think sadly the truth is that by moving with the times, by making the church indistinguishable from the, the current zeitgeist mm. of the culture, mm. um, what's actually happening is people have said, well, we can ignore the church because we can't tell the difference between it and the, and the culture. So why would you well, bother? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll pick up on that in terms of what's happened at the Tron in a moment. But for, for our um, viewers who might not have a, a religious persuasion or might not cover a Christian heritage, they might say, well, like, actually, there's a lot in the Bible that we, we ignore. So we're not too worried about wearing different types of fabric, which was forbidden in the Old Testament, mixing them. Um, we ignore that quite readily. So why can't this just be one of those other things that culturally we move past and we just say, yeah, well, that's something for olden days? Mm. Well, I think, I mean, uh, it, it's easy to sort of... Uh, to, to pull out things like that and say, oh, well, we, we ignore some of these things. I think the truth is we don't ignore these at all. Um, certainly not if we follow the teaching of Christ, who's very clear that not a jot or tittle of what's written in the scripture will, will, will pass away. Mm -hmm. The point is that we don't treat the Bible in a facile way. Uh, we have to, uh, we don't pull texts out of here and there. It's not about proof texting. It's about a coherent uh, theology. And, um, uh, there's a huge distinction to be made between uh, matters of uh, ceremonial law and so on, which uh, belonged to a, an era which is now past because there has been a movement in theological history, uh, not just cultural change. Um, so many things which uh, pertain to the old order uh, before the coming of Christ, such as, for example, circumcision. Um, belonged to the era when um, uh, Israel was the, uh, the the people of God in that particular way before the coming of Christ opened up the mission to the whole world and and the New Testament apostles are very clear about that there's nothing wrong with circumcision but it's not binding anymore circumcision means nothing nor uncircumcision what matters is um, uh, keeping the commands of Christ. And, and so theologically, these things are, are, are very clear. Uh, morality in terms of marriage, in terms of sexuality, uh, is an unchangeable thing. It's part of the order of creation. Mm. Uh, Christ himself um, affirms that, and the entire New Testament uh, teaches that very clearly. And in fact, is very, very explicit about these things. So, you know, unless you're going to treat the Bible in a very uh, superficial way as just a sort of random book of texts mm. um, and mm. and uh, you know you can't really make these sorts of arguments if we take it uh, as a serious book uh, teaching serious theology uh, which is consistent within itself um, then you know these arguments uh, uh, disappear so for people who are not Christians uh, what I find is that um, uh, among thinking people, there's 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 a respect for a Christian view. What they expect uh, Christians, and particularly Christian leaders, to say is the things that their um, their faith uh, declares. Mm -hmm. And actually, they, they don't have a lot of respect for Christians who are ashamed mm -hmm. of Christian belief and are trying to sort of hide them away in order to please the culture. They've got much mm -hmm. more respect. Say, well, I disagree with you. But you're being consistent with your faith, with your scriptures, with the church, with mm. what you believe, and uh, and we can accept mm. that. And I think mm. that's just a much more um, honest way to, uh, to, yeah. to be really. I certainly find that among friends of, of many different faiths and none, uh, there's th there's much more respect for a consistent position than one that keeps chopping and changing, trying to please people. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And so when you when you you took the Tron out of the church um, and the Tron nothing to do with the 1980s movie just in case anybody's thinking um, but uh, when you took the the church 
uh, out of the kirk, if you like. That must have been a very courageous thing for you to do. Do you want to tell us a little bit about wh what your thinking was at the time and, and what sort of a personal challenge that was at the time? Well, it was a, it was a, it was a very sad time and it was a difficult time. It certainly wasn't uh, something that we relished as a congregation or I, I relished. It certainly wasn't something that I, I wanted to happen, but it was an inevitability that was forced upon us, really. The bottom line was we had to choose between... Um, standing for the truth of the faith that we confess uh, and losing a lot which we did because we lost our building that we had spent uh, just in a few years previously um, several million pounds completely refurbishing and restoring um, uh, we, we, we lost a lot of things we lost a, a, a great location uh, uh, and, and all of that so it was it was very difficult but um, it was simple in the sense that the decision was clear we were having to stand for the faith mm. um, and lose uh, or, uh, or or keep things but but essentially deny deny our mm. our faith and trust in, in Christ and in the scriptures so mm. in one sense it was very difficult in another sense it was very simple um, and I mean personally it was a it was a exhausting <laughs> And, and very stressful time for, mm. for me and for, for our other leaders. Mm. Um, looking back, um, I don't think any of us would regret it at all. Uh, we would regret, you know, obviously the fact that it had to happen in some of those circumstances, mm. but, um, and seeing the way things have gone in the National Church since, uh, uh, you know, I think, there's nobody in our congregation that would say, "Well, we made a we made a mistake." I think there would just be a mm. a, a relief uh, as well as a sadness, really. Um, mm. But we've not lost. Um, we lost a lot of material things, but we've gained immensely uh, in all kinds of ways uh, mm. spiritually. And um, I think the church was greatly strengthened through it. Really, mm. um, that shared struggle gives you a, an advantage, doesn't it? It gives you a bond that you couldn't otherwise have had. I think that. The truth is that in this country, um, most people of my generation and older have have lived in a in a highly unusual time in history that has not been typical of most of the Christian church throughout history, and actually most of the Christian church in the world today. Um, we've lived with the blessings and the benefits of a very Christianized society in the past, which um, which has been a great blessing but has the disadvantage that the church can become unrealistic and um when the culture and the culture's morality and understanding and so on is is, is largely shaped by the christian church then then the christian church um you know in a sense has had a sort of easy ride and the and and and, and the and the alignment of church and culture through many people's lifetimes um, has given a false sense of security in a sense. And, and um, I think that over recent decades, we're probably just reverting much more to the norm. I mean, if you read the Acts of the Apostles now, if you read about the first century church, I think now in our 21st century West, we're, we're more like that than we've ever been in, in my lifetime up until mm. now. Mm. I mean, when I was at school, in the 1970s, um, my friends, parents, my teachers, most adults, uh, they weren't Christians, but they share the same basic worldview, the same basic morality, the same thoughts about marriage, mm. uh, the same thoughts about uh, sexuality and so on. Um, uh, they may have been ignoring some of it, but they knew that they were uh, ignoring it they knew that they were mm, mm. doing wrong or they you know marriage was not always faithful and not always as it should be but um people knew that they were um straying from what was right um so there was much more alignment but 30 40 years on that that is very much not the case and so i think that going through those particular travels for our congregation was a wake-up and it helped us to see that, um, you know, there is there's a big gulf between uh, our outlook on life and our worldview, which is is shaped by uh, by the Bible, mm. and the worldview of the 
of, of, of the culture around about us today, which is rapidly now accelerating away from that. Mm. And so I think, um, I think it's difficult for Christians and particularly of an older generation because everything that um, has been true for most of their lives is now suddenly not true. Mm. Um, whereas I think those growing up now, uh, teenagers uh, within the Christian church are very, very aware of the vast gulf between their home's values and, and the values, for example, mm. uh, w w when they go to school. And I think that's something a church uh, has got to grapple with uh, very much mm. today. I mean, it's not only Christians who are grappling with these things, mm. of course, but um, uh, speaking from a Christian mm. perspective, I think that's uh, that's been true. And so uh, having gone through that um, some years ago for us, I think that that helped us to see uh, the reality perhaps a lot more clearly than we had uh, been doing before. So it's interesting because Carl Truman reflects many of the things you're just saying. People would originally or, or for a long time have identified themselves with with family, with country, with church, uh, perhaps with political allegiances. Whereas more often now it's with identity groups and they yeah. may not be local. They might be worldwide identity groups or something else like that. And it's a very, very different um, paradigm. So in terms of the culture in Scotland more generally, which you've touched on there, which uh, somebody f who lives in Wales, I, I, I can appreciate it similarly. But what's going on in, cult in, in the culture in Scotland? It's almost as if more power is being taken away from the family, more power is being centred around government as if there's a group of people who know much better how to raise and deliver society and civil society than the individuals themselves. Which is, is that what's going on? I think that's a very fair comment. Um, I think since the advent of the Scottish Parliament, um, obviously, and, and to some degree it's similar in Wales, um, there has been you know, a desire to put as much water as possible between Holyrood and Westminster, and that's certainly been true in the last decade with the SNP, uh, the Nationalists, um, in, the, in the majority. Um, and obviously in the last two or three years with COVID, uh, because the most pertinent regulations to do with health were devolved matters, that's allowed a, a, a lot of divergence uh, for the devolved nations. And so there's a lot of politics involved. I think what I would say is that um, what we've noticed is that the Scottish Parliament um, unlike Westminster, it, it has many less checks and balances. It's a single chamber parliament. There's no House of Lords to sort of um, push back on uh, new and progressive legislation. Things that have been held up uh, in Westminster don't get held up in Scotland. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, Scotland took the lead in in um, uh, in, in so-called gay marriage um, and uh, and in other things as well. We've had the sort of the, the ban on smacking. Mm. Um, progressive legislation is 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 easier to advance here because there are less checks and balances, less historic mm. constitutional breaks. Um, and it seems to me that um, there's an open door for campaign groups now. They can use um, the uh, situation of, of, of devolution to focus their campaigns on whichever one of the administrations they think is most likely to um, to successfully receive it and pass it. And of course, once one domino falls, then it inevitably uh, moves on elsewhere. So I think mm. for those who are seeking to undermine um, uh, traditional views of marriage and the family and, and the responsibility of parents and so on and so forth, um, uh, they've now got a number of different targets and, and, they, and they can go for the softest one and, and it will almost always go on elsewhere. And the Scottish Parliament, unfortunately, has, you know, has not got a good record in that. It, it, the infamous named person scheme oh. uh, was a terrible piece of legislation, which, you know, was an enormous threat to, mm. uh, to the family in particular. Now, that was seen not just by Christians, um, but by many right across the board uh, in the in the campaign against that and as you know eventually it was uh, overturned in the supreme court with very damning comments i mean the the, mm. the justices in the supreme court made comments about um the totalitarian nature of mm. the uh, of the government that was trying to do this um mm. and you know fortunately uh, the campaign there was successful but it hasn't gone away and aspects mm. of that have been brought back in by the back door. And so this was just, just to remind um, um, viewers who may not know about that. This was an idea where 
uh, every child in Scotland uh, would have uh, a civil servant, a named civil servant, who would have ultimate responsibility for them, uh, as opposed to their parents, which is... <laughs> Just yes, essentially. So it would be um, it would be uh, perhaps health visitors, or it would be social workers, or it would mm. be uh, school uh, head teachers, uh, or whatever. And and it, and in essence, although it was pretending to be for the benefit of uh, you know mm. children's welfare, really it was draconian in that um, uh, named persons would 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 receive confidential information you know from health professionals and so on. All sorts mm. of stuff would be shared mm. with these named persons that wouldn't be shared. Uh, even with parents, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a terrible, uh, massive overreach uh, of the state, and rightly uh, put down uh, by the uh, by, by the Supreme mm. Court. But that, it, it shows you the, it shows you the direction of travel, and it shows you the instinct of the government, which is that um, really the state is uh, the primary mover and the primary uh, authority and mm. responsibility over uh, over children and and, and not parents. That's right. So, I mean, going forward then, so the, the Tron has done objectively well since leaving the Kirk. You've, your, your, your membership is doing very well. It's a vibrant church as far as I can make out, as far as everyone says. Uh, it's growing. It's sticking to its, its fundamental beliefs. And people seem to like uh, attending that kind of a church. Is, have I summarized the situation well? Uh, well, I think that that's, uh, you're being very kind, but I think... Um, Essentially, that that is true. Yeah, we've we uh, are a healthy church. We've moved now into three different premises. Uh, we, we had one, we lost one, but we've now got three. We have um, five different congregations meeting on a Sunday, and we have things going on every day of the week. We have a uh, a Farsi speaking congregation, which has grown up over the last ten years uh, from people from largely from Iran and a few other countries. Yeah, I think I think what, what I would say is. Um, to put it in simple terms is that people people who are christians want uh, uh want a church that's unafraid to be a christian church and people who are looking to find out what christianity is all about want to find a church that's unafraid to be a christian church and will tell them what christianity actually is yeah. um and and people who are are seeking and searching for truth want to hear people who actually believe that what they're speaking is true yeah, yeah. Um, and so what they don't want is a church that's pretending to be something else or you know won't tell you what it really believes because it doesn't want to fall out with anybody i mean so so um we're doing what we're doing because we believe that's the calling of of the christian church uh, and i think that um th there's no point in having a church that isn't going to be the church um and mm. and so other churches like ours, I mean, we're in touch with lots of the churches that have uh, done the same as us, and uh, all of them really are are thriving. Um, mm. uh, not because we're way out and wacky or fundamentalist or crazy, but just because we're basic Christianity, basic historic Orthodox Christianity. Um, mm. And actually, across the world, that is what's growing. In our country, that's what's growing. And everything else which is ashamed of really being truly christian is i'm afraid gradually disappearing so is a, there's a clear message there uh for uh for the kind of churches that the, the country needs and actually uh, what people who are seeking that out mm. actually mm. want now you mentioned something earlier on it's very very interesting which i want to pick up on the 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 idea that um uh, Christians had almost become complacent because we'd grown up with a Christian heritage. Mm. And in many ways, uh, lots of the institutions that formed our civil society were created by Christians. And Christians have just uh, more often just sat back recently. And, and those things have begun to maybe be infiltrated with other sorts of influences, let's say. Uh, and this idea of being salt, of stopping the rate of decay, Christians haven't really done. And we've got to where we've got to in society and lots of different. We could look at all the detail of that, but we've got to where we've got to. And so my question is next. What do we do going forward? Because we've we've been used to being a little bit complacent uh, as as a Christian church. We're also a little reticent. We're not as shouty as other lobby groups. Uh, you, you're not as aggressive as a, as as other placard waving um 
activists. Mm -hmm. So where's the hope going forward? What do, what does the church do to uh, be more impactful, to stop the rate of decay, to stand up for what it knows uh, are good things in society and good ways and methods, marriage, of course, being one. Uh, where do you go from here? What happens? Well, I think that it's very simple, really. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you have to uh, take up your cross uh, and follow me. Uh, not take up your swords, but take up your cross. In other words, you ought to be prepared for cost. You've got to be prepared uh, to suffer loss uh, in, in the world's terms, uh, but not loss uh, in eternal terms. Um, Jesus said that, you know, one of the reasons that people who uh, might have believed him but wouldn't confess and follow him is because they crave the praise of man not more than the praise of God. And I think that's the real challenge for uh, for Christians is to live for eternity, not just live uh, for this world, for this world's praise. Because if we are standing in, in the culture that we're in now as, as our um as our uh, society and culture around us has, has, has increasingly moved away from its, its Judeo-Christian heritage, um, there will be cost and, you know, there will be uh, less and less of the praise uh, of the culture around. And we've got to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that Jesus, there's an old hymn that says, Jesus won the world through shame and beckons thee his road. Um, when, when we're walking with Christ in this world, that's what we need to expect and it's all about it's all about our expectations and our horizons and if we're living for the praise of god and not the praise of man then we have to learn to lose with god in the world's eyes but to lose is 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 gain and the truth is that authenticity in christian belief and in christian life is actually a very attractive thing um to see uh, the beauty of um, stable uh, marriage and family life, to see the security that that gives, to see all the benefit that that gives to, uh, to, to children, uh, to parents, to old people, to community. Um, people are crying out for these things. You know, we're living in a world of uh, uh, an absolute crisis of, uh, of loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been interesting with all the lockdowns, you know, um, showing up just, just how crucial it is to have um uh to, to, to have community and to have connection with people and so on now, you know we're living in a world where there's so so much fracture but actually to witness healthy uh honest true uh christian living which in in, in one key aspect of that is uh, is within marriage and family life that is a very attractive thing and the church has got a bright light to shine uh, in a world that is very dark and mm -hmm. among people who are, are searching for these things. So it's it's the simple things. It's Christians being mm -hmm. Christian, mm -hmm. living mm -hmm. for the values that uh, our, our, our Lord uh, teaches us and shows us and live, living for the praise of our Father in heaven and not for men. Mm -hmm. That is a powerful witness in the world. And so where that is happening and where the church is unafraid, the, the church is growing and, you know, right through history. Uh, the famous saying that the, the blood of the martyrs has been the seed of the church. Well, that's true. Where Christians uh, are, are suffering, the church is growing. Where Christians are, are, are unwilling to bear cost and want to have all the things that the world uh, has, you know, the, the church is fading. So it's hard, but it's simple. Mm. And so the church needs to keep on being the church keep uh, preaching its, uh, its message and, and living the life of true disciples and mm. that is how that's how the church grows and that's how um uh, that's how uh, people um uh, are, are brought into uh, to the orbit of, of of hearing the gospel so i'm very positive i mean you know the the, the decline in in institutionalized national religion is not necessarily a bad thing because mm. a lot of it was just i'm afraid a, a, an edifice around you know, a rather dead religiosity. Um, and, you know, that's a, that, that's a pretty killing thing. Um, and if, if, if much of that is being swept aside um, so that that which is real and vibrant is seen to be what real Christianity is, then yeah. I think that's probably a very good thing. Sad in one way, but very necessary and, uh, and very positive in another. 
a little bit more authenticity. I, lo I love that point. So in Christianity, in society more generally, uh, talking just uh, as a note to uh, one of one of the more long standing MPs in Westminster, Sir John Hayes, uh, a while ago. And he was he's quite he's quite um, distinctive in his viewpoints. And he knows that many of his constituents disagree with him. But he says they vote for him because he's authentic, yeah. because they know he's real and what he says he means. Um, and he's a genuine person. And what you see is exactly what you get. And, th and they want that. And they know he's not going to give them fluff. He's not going to lie to them. What you see is exactly what you get. And and that's, again, what I think we want more the church to return to, what society needs the yeah. church to return to. Well, it's a rarity, isn't it? I'm afraid in public life and certainly at the moment, uh, authenticity uh, in our political leaders and so on has been sadly lacking. And so absolutely, I think that is vital uh, for the mm -hmm. church. And as you say, people respect it mm -hmm. uh, and they expect it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I was giving an interview on uh, on uh, uh, television some time back and um, I didn't say anything particularly uh, other than just basic Christianity. And some mm -hmm. of the comments afterwards were that, um, you know, he actually spoke as as I might have expected a church yes. leader to actually speak. In other words, he he seemed to believe his own message. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, what a what a staggering thing that somebody should be, you know, that that should be such a, a surprising thing. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the church leaders uh, need to be seen to actually believe themselves mm -hmm. what they are speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, how on earth can everybody else believe them? Um, and you know. Uh, that that that's authenticity is mm. is is what we need right across society and certainly from the church and let me just cover w one thing off um homosexuals are welcome at the tron yep absolutely yeah we have yeah. we have uh, uh, numbers of people uh who would uh who would fall into that category uh, in our congregation always have and in fact mm. one of the one of the most difficult things um particularly when we were going through that period of uh, of of uh, of strife when we were still in the Church of Scotland. One of the things I found most difficult was that I was having to speak about this sort of thing in public uh, mm -hmm. often, uh, and I was very acutely aware of those in the congregation for whom these were very personal struggles, and it was it was, it was one of the biggest uh, heartaches for me. But one of my biggest encouragements was in speaking to some of these people at that time and saying, "Look, I." I I feel for you at the moment because this must be very difficult and universally they said to me you must speak about this you must say what you're saying you must stand up for this that's what helps us mm -hmm. be true to christ uh if you pretend it away or don't speak about it that's the very worst thing for us so mm -hmm. i i was very encouraged by that because because you know I, you're aware that these are painful painful issues and mm -hmm. uh and of course people throw at you accusations of homophobia and all this all this sort of nonsense uh, nothing can be further from the truth mm -hmm. and um I, in my in my experience um in 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 different churches that i have been part of um there has been nothing but uh, love and care and concern and support for people uh, with all kinds of uh, different uh, sexual struggles and battles uh, uh, in their life and, um, and, and, and and there's nowhere you're likely to get more love and support th than with a church that is really serious about the gospel and, and serious about discipleship uh, mm. uh, for Christ. So uh, I, I would want to just be very, uh, very clear and open about that. Mm, that's excellent. Well, I think it's a wonderful place for us to end our conversation. Can I thank you for your stand? Uh, uh, stand for one man, one woman marriage. And again, that's not to say that other things don't exist in a liberal democracy, but clearly uh, you feel that's consistent with the Bible's teaching. Uh, we feel it's very consistent with the evidence on a population basis for the best outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it's something uh, the government should be promoting. It's something the churches should be promoting, uh, but nevertheless to deal with everybody in society in a loving and respectful way. Uh, William Philip, Reverend Dr. William Philip, it's such a privilege to talk to you. Uh, I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Tony, it's my pleasure.